Ladies and gentlemen, presenting the professor, Greg Dooley, and the pundit, Steve Clark. Men, take the mic. That's right. This is the professor and the pundit with Greg Dooley and Steve Clark. We're presented by Nick Hopwood, a certified financial planner, founder, and president of Peak Wealth Management. Retire with confidence. It's great to be joined with Greg Dooley once again. Greg, how are you? Good, man. Doing great. How are you, Steve? Doing well. And Greg, we sit in the press box, but if we really want to have fun at a Michigan game now, we might have to sit in the stands. Because it can get a little sudsy you're, out in the big house. You're assuming that there's not going to be a beer tap in the press box, obviously. Uh, obviously. Not <laughs> okay. one in the press box. Although some of the writers, some of the writers and broadcasters could benefit from having one or two before actually writing. When I picture like an old sports writer, I picture chomping a cigar and they have like flask or something that they're taking pulls off of. It seems to be part of part of that vibe. But yeah, the, the press box is probably going to remain dry, but the rest of the stadium with the new law could allow alcohol is what I'm hearing. So Now see, the thing is, I wasn't around when people are telling stories about cases being thrown over a fence and over rows and people sharing things in jugs and I heard that flasks the- and all that sort of It seemed like everybody was getting toasted at a Michigan game in the 70s. There was no security. I was, I was never around that. Every, every time I've been around the stadium, they're like checking inside your jacket. They want to make sure that nothing's in your pockets. And it's like, it's a, how did these people ever get away with it back then? Because I I certainly never saw it growing up. Two points of view. I heard in the 60s, you would literally have groups of students with a keg sitting in the stands. Exactly. Yeah. How, how did that... It, it's like, I think they we, just... We went from completely allowing it to happen to a dead stop. We're checking everybody. Well, I think... Type of environment. I think they just covered it with a box and they just said, this is our droid, right? Star Wars was hot, <laughs> right? They just wheeled it right in, right? Made a few beeps. So when I went to school in the early 90s, yeah, we used to just jam the fireball, whatever, the flask in our pants, and no one no one ever checked. I mean, it, it, it's like the Kentucky Derby. You're not technically supposed to bring in booze, but everyone, everyone figure, figures nobody, out a way. And nobody, and nobody felt there was much enforcement. No, and like we thought we were so clever when we went to the Kentucky Derby one time. We hollowed out the bottom of Coke cans and filled them up with rum or something like that, right? And sealed them up with aluminum tape in the bottom and put them right on top of our cooler. You can bring a cooler in with Mm. non-alcoholic drinks. They tore our tickets and went in, and they inspect everyone's coolers. That guy grabbed that six-pack, lifted it high in the air, immediately (laughs) looked under it, and threw it in the trash. And, (laughs) like, this is the oldest scheme in the books, guys. Nice try. So that didn't work. But, so about this law, so I did have a a little birdie told me, someone who's very, very influential in state government, that there was one school that was the one pushing for this new law. And and by the way, all of these laws, they don't just come out of thin air. There's someone, say, lobbying or influencing a legislator to create a bill, right? That's how the system works. So, Steve, any guesses on who was the school that was pushing for this? Michigan State. You're a winner. Well done. <laughs> Check out the big brain on Steve. Yeah, it, the, he told me that it was definitely state, you know, obviously the athletic department. And this isn't double sourced or anything like that, but this is what I was told. I'm not surprised. State cut their swim dive program due to financial constraints. So they're the ones that signed the deal with the devil with Caesar's Sportsbook, which I believe they're backing off of now. So does it surprise you that they went this way? And, and clearly, it's a new revenue source for them. It's over and above concession sales. Alcohol, absolutely. You can sell, what, a cup of beer for, what do they sell it for? But Pistons games, like 12 bucks. The margin on that must be ridiculous. It's huge. Uh, just looking this up, and the numbers may not be as big as you would think, Purdue just a couple of years ago said they made $1.2 million from alcohol sales in football. Ohio State said they had over $1.7 million just recently, but schools like Iowa said they sold $3 million in alcohol sales last year, 
and so did Tennessee. Now, those numbers come down when it comes from sales to actual profits, then to splitting the profits uh, with your alcohol vendor, which they say is about 50-50. But depending on who you are, it might be a six-digit sum in terms of profit, while others, it's a little over seven digits, you know, somewhere between one and two million dollars per season. And what's shocking to me is 11 out of the 14 Big Ten schools now allow alcohol sales. Now, 10 years ago, no Big Ten school would ever think about trying to bring this up because that's just something the Big Ten would do. We're too morally above everybody else. You go ahead and do that in all your other conferences. Here in the Big Ten, it means more. No, wait, wasn't that another conference that says that it means more? Anyway, (laughs) we're not going to stoop down to that level because that's not what we do with the Big Ten. But what was happening was some of these schools weren't bringing in the attendance. Places like TCF Financial in in Minneapolis, they they built a a smaller stadium. Yeah, they have a beer garden. Right. right. They, were one of, cool. they were one of the first schools to do it. And that was the thing we all laughed at. It's like, Minnesota has to go to alcohol sales now to bring people to their games. Oh, my gosh, what a ridiculous fan base. And, and slowly but surely, 11 out of the 14, Michigan and Michigan State, look like it's going to be going to the governor's desk if she hasn't already signed it. It's going to make it 13 out of 14. And I went to Minnesota when, when I believe it was just opened because we played there for the jug, right? And mm-hmm. I got to decide because we're playing there this year. I got to decide whether I'm going out there for that. But I remember seeing that beer garden and I was like, well, that's kind of cool because it's like in one of the end zones and it's kind of like in a special area. Now, I guess the question is, obviously, if my information is correct, state's not going to hesitate and implement this. No. Um, And let's just assume it's going to get signed by Big Gretch, uh, our governor here, soon. I do wonder if Michigan will do it. And not that Michigan doesn't like money and doesn't like other revenue sources. And and we've had alcohol in our stadium before for the NHL events and the soccer events that we've had. I mean— you can't have the maple leaves here and not have alcohol no. sales. There'd be yeah. a riot on our hands. No, it's got to be Labatt or Molson, too. I believe, yeah, I believe that was the mm-hmm. argument, too. We, we don't want to have a riot in Ann Arbor, do you? you know, let's, <laughs> let's allow this. So, so they got that temporary permit. I wonder if we'll go right to it. I assume we will eventually. But I wonder if we'll go right to it right away. But I don't know. What do you think, Steve? Do you think we'll go for that? Because I do think Michigan thinks we're, we're above that, just like the, advertise, the, the lack of advertising in the state. I think if Dave Brandon was still the athletic director, it would have been here yesterday. Yeah. But I don't know what Ward Manuel is going to do about that. But I assume that the money is going to be too good. I think there will be a thorough investigation of how much more enforcement is needed yeah, and I've heard multiple arguments on this. There's some people who say, well, it's really not making people more drunk because what people do before they come in the stadium anyway, if they're not sneaking things in, let's just say that. Because I have walked the stadium after everyone's left, and you mm-hmm. see plenty of bottles of Fireball and stuff. I mm-hmm. keep saying Fireball. Mm-hmm. Maybe that's a new sponsor for us, Steve. Okay, let's try but, it. All right. But the, the whole notion that you're not going to do a couple shots before you head in. There is evidence out there from stadiums that started selling alcohol that they have not found any significant spike in increased violence since having that new policy. Or use the opportunity for the game to sober up, right? Which I think is what some, <laughs> who, especially all the people who drove. So we'll see, man. I think the bathroom lines will get longer again. Oh, that's true. The bathroom situation. You know, hey, have a drink in the first half is going to lead to a bathroom break in the fourth quarter. The bathroom sitch. Steve, good call. That, that's going to be a problem. As we get older, the parking and bathroom situations become premium premium so it's, it's a one score game in the fourth <laughs> quarter the line yeah, is long right but it, it can be anybody's game i gotta go what yeah. do i do yeah these long tv timeouts aren't so bad then right because yeah maybe you have time to get back i've tried to avoid going to the bathroom at michigan stadium just in general but it was sort of like cattle being pushed in through this narrow opening and i hate to say it but We've been in the press box so long, Steve. I, I, don't, yeah. I can't remember the last time I used one of those facilities. It used to just be the troughs. Did they, right. did they change that? Right, that's what that? I'm saying. I, think, <laughs> I feel, I, I don't know if it's changed because it's been a while, but it was like this long, massive line of people squeezing in 
elbows <laughs> elbows under your rib cage. Yeah. And basically you're still moving. I just wanted to say moo into the bathroom, going through the trough, and you kind of start off at one end of the trough and you hope you're finished by the time you get to the end of the trough and you gotta zip up and walk out because it's a continuous moving thing. Yeah, it's it's kind of weird. And I think they might have maybe they got rid of that. I don't know. So, so people are gonna yell at us that we're spoiled for being upstairs. And we are, by the way. We are very spoiled. <laughs> I'm sure they can do the math on what the alcohol sales would be. Uh, I wonder if they want the hassle. We'll see. I mean, the department is always going to look for more revenue, especially if revenue sharing becomes a thing. They're going to be right. looking for these new sources. And right. that may be the thing that puts it over the top to say, look, sorry, guys, our fuel goal net is going to be sponsored by Allstate. And sorry, and Meyer is going to sponsor our scoreboard. And we, we just got to do it. And there's a few extra million dollars there. And it's going to piss everybody off, but they're going to use revenue sharing as the argument. You want to keep all our sports? You want a 1,000 student-athletes at Michigan? We have one of the biggest athletic departments in the, in the country. You want to keep it that way? we got to do this. And I think that's probably how that would pack you up. It, what I do know is that no matter how much revenue you bring in, they will find a way to spend it. Oh, yeah. It will be spent. Yeah, it's and, not a and, business. And, this isn't a for-profit business, including the hospital. I don't know. It was twelve or $14 billion budget was released less than 2% margin on that, Steve. Yeah. I mean, it, yeah. and if you're looking for a way to spend money, you can give a private jet to your assistant coaches on recruiting trips. They'll find a way to spend the money no matter how much the revenue comes in. If I can transition, you talked about the variation between the policies of the different states. Well, that's an interesting tie-in right now with what's going on in NIL because what you're seeing is, and we've talked about this, is a lot of states are creating their own laws that give the schools in their states a competitive advantage in NIL. And many of them write in there that say, hey, no matter what we do with NIL, you can't touch us. So one thing, Steve, that, that the NCA came out with was they just delivered a memo recently to all the schools, and it had a little Q&A in it, okay? And the <laughs> Q&A was based on actual questions and scenarios that they've seen or heard. And obviously, if the NCA is going to produce something, it's with a purpose in mind. But they actually address this. They address this notion that, hey, states are creating their own rules. What does that mean to the NCAA? So basically they said, hey, man, sure, go ahead and have your special little state laws. But the NCAA membership is voluntary. You're voluntary members of this organization. And by the way, we have a process to change our rules if you'd like to change them. But we're not going to tolerate you and your state legislature having a special rule and how your universities and students and high school students can interact with NIL that go outside our rules, we're not going to have it. And of course, they were directed at some of the states that already have laws in the books. Michigan doesn't have one that specifically defies the NCAA yet, but they are talking about a new rule that might go against it in saying that schools can facilitate deals. So in other words, Jim Harbaugh could sit down under this, as I read it, if it's passed, could sit down and his coaching staff could work with Meyer or work with a donor to create an NIL deal for an active student athlete, right, not a recruit. So the NCAA is basically saying no. And Texas A&M's athletic director already said, okay, well then sue us. So Steve, this is going to come to a head one way or the other, either through the federal government or the federal courts. This will come to a head. When? I don't know. But already state and state schools are saying, good luck enforcing it, NCA. Oh, and by the way, look at your track record in the courts. I wouldn't, I wouldn't bother because you keep getting beat up, even by this Supreme Court, nine to nothing. <laughs> so let's, let's dance. <laughs> you know, let's dance the Texas two-step is what Texas a and the director just And his name is uh, Ross Bjork. Yep. So there's a couple of things that come up. Well, let's start with Texas A&M. One of the deals with NIL and is being challenged by just about everybody is the fact that those that donate to the NIL program or a collective can get priority points at Texas A&M for better seating, better perks, better whatever. And that on the surface seems to be a line crossed. Well, here's my read on it. I think you can do things like that, okay? As long as it's the same, you can provide these benefits. I think you can, Steve. The problem with what Texas A&M and Texas are doing 
is they're using their existing fundraising vehicles, their foundations, like the Twelfth Man Foundation for Texas A and M. They're using that to go. One of the lanes that that we can use when you support the Twelfth Man Fund is NIL. That's too closely associated with the school, and there's a transaction involved. So while the Twelfth Man Fund is technically a separate organization, the NCA views it as part of Texas A&M. What they say is so closely tied that it's indistinguishable between. And I think everyone would agree with that. It's it'd be like athletics development Michigan getting involved and saying, "Sure, you you want to write us a check for a million dollars? We can give two hundred of that to NIL." I think that Steve, that's what the NCA has the problem with. How you give out points and benefits, that's just an extension of, to me, what they see as the bigger problem. You got me? Sure. It's, it's a marriage between the school and NIL and the transactions. And I think that's where they're trying to draw the line. And I think that's going to be a problem because that's what Texas and Texas A&M are really doing. And so the points and things like that, um, that's just a demonstration of how tight the marriage is. I think the school, Michigan, could go – hey, sure, we can come up with a way for Champion Circle to provide points, likes, or similar system of points. But but to me, it's the notion of offering that. You're demonstrating that marriage that they don't want. So that's where I think it's verboten. And by the way, to my knowledge, there are no plans for Michigan to integrate its priority point system with the collectives now or in the future. But that's where we stand. Second issue, I think it's either in Oklahoma or Missouri where state legislation has said that kids in high school yeah. can start getting money off of NIL if they attend if if they attend the university within their own state. That's right. So a competitive advantage if you're making a decision whether to go to Missouri or Rutgers, hey, go to Missouri and under our state law, you can start benefiting from NIL immediately. Like, you can start working on your deals. What they're trying to create is a competitive advantage for their high school students to make a good choice, which is a state school. So if you're a Missouri kid, you can make money right away Yeah, as a high school junior or senior if you pledge your commitment to an in-state school within the state of Missouri. Yep, and I assume it's based on letter of intent or whatever, but yeah. Right, but if you decide I'm going to Illinois, a neighboring state, I can't make money. Yep. As a prep player. You got it. (laughs) You got it. That's it. So that is is the part of the state laws versus the NCAA laws. Yeah. And with that, the SEC is starting to become at war with one another. Because some of these schools are adopting it, while in some other states in the SEC are not. Some of these involve the newcoming schools, Texas and Oklahoma, joining the SEC and having potentially a competitive advantage in that type of situation. And a lot of the old guard are not very happy about that at the moment. They're not. So the, The irony, of course, you might think, oh, we can pay players now legally. Great, because we've been doing it forever. Okay, I think that's pretty widely known that there was shenanigans going on in the South. That's fine, right? We've heard stories, and we've heard stories from recruiting coordinators who said we lost players at the final hour. But here's might have here, happened recently. Here, here's what happens. What happened was the car dealer in Clemson, South Carolina, used to be able to write hundred thousand dollar check, and that used to be the number, right? That was required to get that four star receiver or five star guy, right? Or a couple hundred thousand dollars. And I'm not suggesting these are small numbers, but now the scale for top performing athletes at schools is much higher. So the stakes got raised, and now Michigan can do it. Michigan can provide NIL to active athletes. Okay, I'm not talking about recruiting, okay? But what you can talk about is all the opportunities at Michigan when you come here. That's something that can be public, that can be very vivid. You can answer questions to the family. You can point them to Jared Wangler and Champion Circle or Jamie Morris over at Stadium in Maine and go, you can talk to them about their program. Okay, you just can't offer any promises or inducements or incentives to come here. Okay, but the existence of these things, so this leveled the playing field against the South, who was paying players all along, and the stakes got raised. So now Michigan donors who didn't want to get involved with any of this crap before, hopefully they didn't, right? Now they can. 
And do you want to go up against Michigan's money cannon, as we call it, Steve? <laughs> I believe it's undefeated, <laughs> as we like to say on the internet. Okay. So now they got to compete. And I think, and again, I think we'll talk about this. I, I, I was able to sit in on Michigan's Empower presentation, but it's part of their message that this is a competitive advantage for Michigan, actually. If you do it the right way and you leverage our unbeaten, undefeated alumni base, right, that we can win the long game here and win it now. We got to get the right people involved and get the right people on board. And I think the athletic department needs to have a unified strategy around this. But we can win and we can beat the car dealer who is probably going to get tired. Think about the guy at Mississippi State who got all excited about NIL and he's writing this big check. And then Mississippi State gets beat down once again in the SEC. You know, at some point, they call it donor fatigue, right? Don't Mm -hmm. you get tired of it? And by the way, if you're the only one writing the checks, you start to get pissed off because where's everybody else? Where's the other guy? I know that guy's got money. You know they, they you know they know each other, Steve. Like the the guys with the deep pockets. Why isn't so and so writing a check? Why isn't that family in in on this? Don't they want us to win? Why am I the only one doing it? And by the way, I've heard this firsthand from other donors, not at Michigan, that they want a sustainable collective and a sustainable source of revenue for this if we're going to if we're going to do it but not just for me not just me and my family everybody okay but i I think michigan can win the long game do you think michigan's going to have a problem because they went 15 years without football success um no 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 because i think people they felt the, the the timing of us winning yeah sure maybe if it was a little before this it would have been better before the nil stuff came down but I don't think it's a problem because, I, honestly, like I'm a Lions fan, right? And it, I haven't wavered one bit through all these brutal years. It just made the glimpses of success like we had at the end of last year taste even sweeter. Now, maybe Harbaugh, if he continues to you know, talk to NFL teams and things like that over, let's say if he does it again next year, that could show cracks in the foundation of what we're built here, but I don't know. That's my no, that's no, my initial no, what, reaction. What I'm just thinking is that you've got 15 years worth of Michigan graduates that love their time at Michigan, but the football team wasn't the highlight of their Michigan experience. And you know, for 40, oh, right. for 40 years, there were Michigan graduates who loved the University of Michigan, loved their degree, and helped get them to where they're at. And one of the major highlights of my college experience was watching Michigan win and compete for Big Ten titles. That's kind of absent. It's sort of like, yeah, I went to Michigan and all the things academically was great. And the basketball team had a few good hits and all that. But they don't see the football team the way that previous graduates did. And at some point, that generation of graduates, when they start to accumulate wealth, won't see the football program the same way as the past graduates did because the love and success isn't the same. So it's like a bad recruiting class doesn't change your football team immediately. But a couple of years down the line, when they're juniors or seniors and much is expected from them, they won't produce Will that Michigan money cannon in a decade or so be running low on ammo for like a decade? So I, I, I disagree because, and I don't know, you, you could be right. I'll talk to my nephew. My nephew actually caught the, the tail end of the success, mm-hmm. um, but he's a recent grad. I have lots of students that live through the first part of all this. But of course, since I've been teaching, Michigan's been great. Maybe it's me, Steve, by the way, because I started, you know, in the fall. We'll see. I think that no matter what, your experience with the football team, even in the down years, of course, obviously COVID is a factor, but let's put that aside. You had those moments. You had beating Notre Dame or you had the Wisconsin game with Rich Rod. And you, you experienced those, those, those small moments. And as always, the hope, like we talked about the preseason ratings, there was always someone who had Michigan finally breaking through and winning the Big Ten this year. <laughs> and I feel like that, that feeling also goes through the student body. I, I don't know that period has left, say, a half a generation of scarred Michigan grads, but I could be wrong. Yeah, it, it could have, you know, as they become business leaders and things like that, maybe their association with the school is stronger than, say, many other people like me who grew up in a golden era where we won a Big Ten championship every year and had, went to Final Fours and Frozen Fours and all that stuff in the early 90s. And maybe I'll talk about this next time, but I was able to attend the Empower event 
And one of the themes of the Empower event, and the Empower is kind of this brand, this marketing brand that the football team developed to identify opportunities not only for NIL, but also business partnerships. Because now donors can have relationships in some form or another. Business donors, actual donors can have relationships with players, right? And how do we leverage the biggest living alumni in the world? And I can go into that a little bit later. But what was really interesting was this notion that, look, Michigan is going to have another giant multi-billion dollar fundraising campaign. And when I say Michigan, I mean big Michigan, right? School, hospital, everything, right? And one of the big donors was at the Ann Arbor event and made the point that it all starts, all the conversations tend to start with the one thing that unites us. Yes, the Block M, but sports, athletics, and often it's the football team. And it sets the tone, right? It calls the tune for the conversation around giving for the, for the school. And it, it is that thread that binds us. So um, when you talk about like NIL and how do we help the football team and support athletics, you're really supporting the brand that is Michigan. And it's much bigger than that. And there's probably no more vivid example of that than the Woodson event, right? It's Charles up there. It's Greasy, right? It's Hutchinson. It's all those football players under this umbrella. None of that money goes to the athletics, right? It's all for the hospital, and it's build wings. I was in the cardiovascular center, and, you know, there's a statue of Bo there, and, you know, part of that was donated in his legacy. It's just such a big part of everything we do at Michigan, and supporting it, there is a bigger picture to it, and I really think the Woodson event embodies that. You know, Charles Woodson is one of the biggest alumni at University of Michigan right now, but it just reminded me, I saw some sort of release, and I can't remember if it was the Big Ten, whoever did it. AI figured this oh, out, Greg. Oh, okay, great. The, yeah. You want to you want to get me going? No, I, I, and I love AI, and I love what it can do. It but, tends to piss me off when you start talking to ask it for lists, but go ahead. Yes, well, <laughs> published was a list last week of the most... Famous alumni at each Big Ten school. Mm. And it is interesting that the number of schools that had an athlete as the number one most notable alumni. Nebraska seemed to make sense with Warren Buffett. Okay. Yeah, sure. Ohio State was Jesse Owens. Okay. What do you think Michigan is? I mean, it's, it's probably Gerald Ford. It is Gerald Ford. Okay. AI came up with Gerald Ford, but how far pretty back, good. How far back is Charles Wood? How far back <laughs> is Charles Woodson from Gerald Ford? He's back. I, I think Tom Brady slotted ahead of Woodson. No offense, Charles. I'm trying to think. Who are we missing, Steve? It's, it's tough because what Ford does, right, is he transcends. He's, he's a football player. But he was the United States president. Granted, not elected. Right. <laughs> but he was the United States president. Yeah, it's tough after that. So yeah. here are some of the other schools that are just off the top of my head. Yeah. Indiana, Mark Cuban. Oh boy. That's yeah, that's your best one. That's the best you can do. How about this for Rutgers? James Gandolfini. Wow. And there if, you go. And if you're laughing too hard at that and saying this is ridiculous, how about we go to the University of Iowa? where their most notable alumni is Ashton Kutcher. <laughs> oh, right, right. <laughs> That's funny. Most notable, right? It was either the most notable or the most famous alumnus. Yeah, okay. Of that university. Yeah, yeah. Ashton Kutcher. Wow. They got, do better. <laughs> do better. It's funny because I think Niall Kinnick was well on his way, right? Oh. And died too early. Um the thing to me about Niall Kinnick that what I remember seeing a documentary about was that he seemed to be on the same track yeah. as JFK. Yes. That's and what I remember, too. You had a Heisman Trophy winner. You had a guy going off to war. He was a pilot, just like Tom Harmon was a pilot. Both of them went down in their airplanes, but Tom Harmon survived. Niall Kinnick did not. But Niall Kinnick seemed to have a future in politics and in, in civics and, and, and government. And as I said, somebody was bringing up the part that he was could potentially have rivaled JFK at that era. Yeah, if you want to piss your better half off, there's a very, very good argument to be made that Tom Harmon should have won also the Heisman in 1939. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I hate to say it, but if you actually, if they were the only two candidates and you weren't pulling votes anywhere other direction, if they just solely looked at them together and they did play against each other that year and Harmon dominated. Mm-hmm they would have picked Harmon. 
<laughs> so well, that, that would they, have been and, something. And they revere Niall Kinnick down there. Sure. Because before each and every home game, they play his Heisman Trophy winning speech on the video boards, either just before the players come out or just after they come out. I forget which one it is. But every home game, like we've got the James Earl Jones, this is Michigan, you know. I love that, by the way. It is great. <laughs> they played Niall Kenick's Heisman Trophy uh, speech, which isn't very long. It's like less than 30 seconds, but they play it every single home game. That's funny. I assume he's the only Iowa player to win the Heisman. Yes. That, okay. So we have three. So that would be hard. And I like the James Earl Jones thing because it embodies everything about Michigan, like what we were just talking about. There's elements of the hospital, the arts, obviously the football. The Heisman Trophy winners are represented there. And more, right? Space. <laughs> Space, bitches, as M. Go Blog <laughs> likes to say. So it's all there. I love that. And, you know, that brings it to mind. Speaking of just tying it back to the Woodson, one of the, the auctions they had was for, they, they printed up all these really cool prints of the, probably not the most memorable game, but really, one of the most gorgeous scenes pregame was the Penn State game, and I forgot. So this was the October uh, game against Penn State where we we pretty much housed them, Steve, if I recall, right? It was the best victory. I mean, most dominating victory. I mean, people say it was Michigan over Ohio State, but the most dominating victory from beginning to end was Michigan over Penn State. Yeah, so it was a maze out. And I remember, like, we've done really bad, we Michigan fans at maze outs, because, I, I don't know, people, people don't care, they don't know. And then when it gets colder, people have a problem because not a lot of people have maze outerwear or right. jackets and things like that. It becomes a problem, right? So I was skeptical. And what happened was not only did the students show up early to this and everyone wore maize, but you had this gorgeous kind of sun heading west. They had two jets going over, and this photographer captured the moment when the jets were going over. And I know we've all seen stadium shots before, but this was really special. This is right before I believe they're about to raise the banner and the band was on the already on the field. And so I got one because it was so cool. And I have these things, and I'm not a big collector of these photos and stuff, but this one was sweet. And it's signed by Charles, by Hutchinson, and they, they gave their HOF and the year on their signature, which is kind of cool, and Greasy as well. I was thinking about having Lloyd Carr also sign it just to kind of <laughs> kind of round it out, but it's a really cool print. Maybe I'll put a link to it. I'll, I'll show mine in the show notes on mvictors.com because it's really cool. We're about to hit the fourth quarter on The Professor and the Pundit with Greg Dooley and Steve Clark. But before we do, we're joined by Nick Hopwood, certified financial planner. He's also the president and founder of Peak Wealth Management. Now, Nick, you're known as Mr. Roth as we continue to discuss the differences between traditional versus Roth IRAs and 401ks. And what's better for you, the listener? We've talked about some of the advantages that a Roth has, like growing tax-free forever. The other advantage with Roth, if I'm correct, too, is the government doesn't have any rules on when you have to start drawing it down, where the other way, I believe, if I'm correct, right, is that yeah. you have to start, because they want their tax money, right, because you have to pay taxes on those traditional withdrawals. They're kind of dictating to you when you can draw it down, whereas you have that flexibility, right, with the Roth of when to touch it, but more importantly, when not to touch it. Yeah, the uh, rule was 70 and a half. Now it's 70, 73, and it's going to 75, actually. So this will be 75 for, for our age group. But, but imagine this, thinking about those required minimum distributions. If I'm a University of Michigan grad, I'm doing all the right things, great income, great savings. I get to a million in my portfolio by age 40. I see a lot of these guys, okay? They got a million at 40. Well, if they're growing through deposits and good returns... It should be $2 million minimum by 50, right, if we double every 10 years, $4 million by 60, $8 million by age 70, you know, maybe $12 million by age 75. These are going to be monster required minimum distributions where you're going to be in that 37% bracket, soon to be 39.6, forever. So you just have nowhere to hide on these taxes if you've been a good saver. So that's why three years ago, I went 100% Roth because I'm 44, right? I was a good saver up to age 40, and I decided this is going to be a problem. So I'd rather pay the 37% now, get it over with, and be done. And that's why they call him Mr. Roth. <laughs> <laughs> 
We have a lot going on in the news over the last week or so. And, you know, the college football magazines have now come out. And for the most part, it's looking like Michigan 1, Ohio State 2. Although the odds at DraftKings and FanDuel and MGM all expect Ohio State with better odds to win the Big Ten championship and a better chance of winning the national championship. But when it comes to the writers looking at these college football magazines, a lot of people are saying... Michigan are the champs until they're dethroned. So is there a – because I used to get these magazines, like Athlons. You remember these, Steve? Yeah, Athlons, Lindy's, yes. Phil Steele. Right. Uh, the Athletic has previews, although I don't think the Athletic has come out with a division winner or a championship winner yet. But, yes, they're all out now. I'm still bitter at Phil Steele because when Brandon Graham was having his incredible season, which I believe he went on to win the MVP of the Big Ten – right, the silver Mm -hmm. football trophy. Phil Steele left him off of all three teams on his mid-season Big Ten, (laughs) mid-season, like during the season rankings for the players. And that's such a hard standard, but he left them completely off. And I'm like, this guy's a clown. And, of course, it's probably really hard to do the job that he does. But who who is your go to, Steve? Like, who do you respect the most, or is that is that a loaded question? That is a loaded question, filled with trade secrets uh, into my preview. <laughs> but let's just say I use them all. And when I'm doing a team preview, I gather as much information as I possibly can. And for some schools, it's only a couple of sources, and for other schools, it's a lot. I collect it, I read it, and when I read something, it eventually leads me to asking myself questions. And the authors can't answer the questions back for me, so I start researching even more for the hope that it might provide an interesting answer for me and the listener. And generally, that works for me. But some of the leaders in covering topics or teams are not as good as they used to be, and their coverage has significantly gone down. When you bit. say gone down, like what do you mean? Like, in terms like, of quality and oh, okay. what they're actually saying, you know, is there anything new that's being said, or is it really generic, or is it really off the wall like you you kind of missed it like brandon graham not being selected first second or third team well so speaking of our friend seth fisher they do an awesome job but their their preseason magazine is heavily focused on michigan and they do analysis of the other teams but they have to fill the, the final few pages seth always does a q a and invites me to it but i don't know anything about depth charts or <laughs> opponents or anything like that and ask questions like that but i can see what everyone else wrote you know, mm-hmm. to their answers. And it can't help but influence you. Oh, I didn't think of Minnesota, like when they talked about this. But I, I bring that up because I wonder if there's a little bit of that going on. You know, like the other magazines kind of look at, well, who do they have? Uh, you know, look for clues about who they have ranked in their top 10 or maybe talk to each other. I'm just wondering how homogenized they are. You know what I mean? Well, there is a little bit to it, and I see that through organizations. Like, I see that through Fox Sports. I see that through CBS because, and and to a certain degree, ESPN, but not as much. Say you have a cluster of five that works for the same publisher all seem to be very high on this particular team, while the other three major instruments that are having roundtable Q&A don't even mention them. Okay. Or, or, or don't see them as a champion as this one group does. And when you've got all five individuals that say they're individuals acting on their own, all agreeing that they believe in this or believe in this team, or believe in this coach, it does make it appear that everybody comes out kind of with the same answer. Sort of the same way when you're like picking games and the same five analysts from the same publisher are picking the same upset. Oh, right. What, right, right. what independent work is really being done here? Well, I think there's safety in that, right? And I think we've talked about this before, but I think there's a lot of people who just don't want to look stupid, right? Mm-hmm. Like no one's going to go out there and say, I would assume that Minnesota is going to win the Big Ten, right? Now, if they do, they surprise everybody, but no one's going to maybe maybe hang out there like that. I am curious, though, Steve, was anyone, say, more down on Michigan? Because it's funny saying that, right? But that's kind of where we are right now, where expectations are either 1 or 1A in the Big Ten, and then playoff or just outside it, I suppose, is like the floor. Was anyone like, no, three or four losses, they lost too many key pieces? No, I haven't seen it. It's funny. It's kind of the flip now, Greg. When Michigan wasn't doing well, you had a whole bunch of optimists saying, Michigan's going to win 10, 11 games this year, and they'll win eight. And it's kind of like what their trend was. 
there's always that fringe element here in the local department. But now that Michigan has won back-to-back Big Ten championships, the national media is saying, look, it's going to be Michigan, Ohio State. Look out for Penn State. We're ranking them in the top ten as well. Penn State hosts Michigan this year. Penn State has to go on the road to Columbus. Look out for Penn State. You know, they're, they're a sleeper at number three, but it's Michigan and Ohio State's world. The only people that don't see them as one or two are probably the same local element, but just a different faction, the ones that are more pessimistic on Michigan during a regular season, just in general. So yeah, yeah, I get it. Was any did any uh, of the other Big Ten teams like did did anyone have say a Wisconsin or a Minnesota or somebody of that ilk? Uh, in the Big Ten Championship, or and I don't know if they break it down that tightly, Steve. Well, the the idea that somebody has to represent the West in this final year that the Big Ten has divisions, it's it's it could be anybody. Right. That's, it's, it's, that's true. It yeah. could be anybody again. Six out of the seven teams could possibly do it. I think logistically, it's five. But there's a lot of unknowns. I mean, can Luke Fickle bring Wisconsin back to the top? You know, the, the thing is, Wisconsin made a slight change in their offense and they went down the drain. Luke Fickle is completely changing this offense and it's going to be more passing and it's going to be more of a running quarterback and that's a really really sudden change for Wisconsin but can Luke Fickle change things around in one year Matt Rule with Nebraska Nebraska has always been on the fringe of being a real dominant team but they have always found a way to lose in the last series uh you know under Scott Frost and under the interim coach, it wasn't much different. So Matt Rule's come in there, and he changed Temple around. He changed Baylor around. Can he change Nebraska around in one year? May not take as much since they were so close to winning anyway. And then you have Iowa and and new offense led by former Michigan quarterback Cade McNamara and probably his number one weapon, tight end Eric All, who used to play at Michigan too. Can Iowa's offense register a pulse? And if they can and their defense plays just as well as they've played in the last 10 years, and Iowa's probably as good a threat as anybody to win the Western Division, too. But it's a real crapshoot out there in the wild, wild west. And I do wonder about the long term, like where are we going with with how we're determining champions? Is it going to get weird with all stacked together? We talked about the Big Ten scheduling concept for the next couple years after this, that we agree that it's probably a good thing the way they structured it. But a lot to come. We'll see how it goes. That's going to do it for this week. Thanks for listening, and thank you for subscribing. If you're enjoying the show, please rate and review, and then share it with others. Your reactions make the work rewarding. Special thanks to Nick Hopwood, our sponsor. If you need a certified financial planner or think you could do better with one, go to peakwm.com.